In the following, I am going to show you some important slides about the pathophysiology of the respiratory failure and some help for diagnosing a respiratory failure. Respiratory failure, by definition, when the pulmonary system is no longer able to meet the metabolic demand of the body. So the lung cannot oxygenate the blood or the lung is an, unable to release the carbon dioxide from the blood. Now there are several types of several systems that how we distribute the lung failure, such as the type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, when we do have that was the oldest version and basically this based on the EBG analysis when they could measure directly from the artery or blood the oxygen tension and the carbon dioxide tension. Using this kind of uh, differentiation we have the type 1 such as the hypoxemic respiratory failure when usually the hung, lung has some Parenheimer problem and they do have a problem with the ventilation and perfusion usually this is decreases and another possibility when we do have a very severe condition when we do have a right left shift when the venous blood directly goes to the arteriosus one in these disorders the partial pressure of the oxygen is less than 60 millimercury when breathing in a normal air and the patient can compensate this one. This is due to the difference between the diffusion capability of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide diffusion capability are 50 times better than an oxygen. So this way, when the patient is suffering of hypoxia, hypoxia stimulates the breathing center and the patient responds by hyperventilation. And hyperventilation removing the PCO uh, with carbon dioxide from the uh, artery from the blood and this way the patient has hypocapnia so develops respiratory alkalosis. This is not a complete that's an incomplete uh, respiratory failure. The type 2 where not only the hypoxia occurs but hypercapnia persists as well. So this is called a hypercapnic respiratory failure when the major problem is the alveolar hypoventilation usually the lung parenchyma is intact and in this situation the ABG gas analysis shows a decrease of the oxygen tension and increase of the PCO2 value meaning this patient usually develops a respiratory acidosis now the PO2 less than 60 millimercury is very important because if you remember the lecture of the respiration this is if you look at the hemoglobin saturation curve the 60 millimercury of the PO2 is only down slope or the linear part of this oxygen saturation curve and if you do have on this area the oxygen carrying capability is decreases very rapidly and when the blood reaches the periphery usually the oxygen tension is not enough and on the periphery we do have hypoxemia the type 3 usually that's a very rare form and that's called the perioperative respiratory failure when usually this develops in a gastric uh, uh, operation when the patient develops uh, in a lower lobe atelectasia reversible lower atelectasia and that's usually is a subset of type 1 respiratory failure type 4 respiratory failure is associated with a circulatory shock or help uh, hypoperfuse respiratory failure usually this is di diagnosed as a, a cardiogenic shock distributive shock or hypovolemic shock and so uh, usually secondary to any kind of cardiovascular instability the mixed respiratory failure very common one when the respiratory failure is due to the multiple pathophysiologic processes that can lead to both hypercapnia and hypoxemia usually this is a very severe condition when the oxygen tension decreases very much if you want you can read here uh, using this link about this uh, respiratory failure respiratory failure can be uh, differentiated based on the clinical causes acute when the respiratory failure develops suddenly, minutes to hours, and there is no compensation 
usually severe acid base develops uh, acid base disorders develops and that's a life threatening situation when the patient has time and usually is a low grade respiratory failure is on chronically that days to months to develop and we, there are some compensatory changes such as for example when we do have a hypercapnic respiratory failure due to the decreased pH the kidney is going to compensate and making a little metabolic alkalosis to compensate so the buffer base at the B E B positive the hypoxemic respiratory failure due to the hypoxemia the erythropoietin level increases and we do have an increase of the red blood cells increase of the hemoglobin concentration if we look at the different types of diseases lung diseases we can categorize them some diseases that affecting the airways this kind of diseases usually is obstructive diseases when uh, the airways are affected that carrying the gas uh, in and out of the lungs and there are these airways are narrowed or completely blocked main disease includes such as the asthma bronchiale or chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases these people who has this kind of airways diseases usually describes uh, their feeling as a trying to breathe out through a stove so it's difficult to breathe out so exhale the parenchymal lung parenchymal diseases that affecting the structure of the lung tissue inflammation and or scarring the tissue makes the lung unable to expand fully nearly 150 anti diffuse parenchymal lung diseases in end stage uh, the lung are less capable to function taking up oxygen and raising the carbon dioxide that's a complete lung failure people describe their feeling as a wearing a two tie sweater or vest that won't able uh, won't allow them to take a deep breath another important part of the respiration and then the circulation if you do have an altered pulmonary circulation infected by some kind of diseases that uh, usually the vessels in the lung is affected by clotting, scarring or inflammation they affect the ability of the lungs to make up oxygen and release carbon dioxide these mainly affecting the right heart function and later on the left heart function as well the dominant ventilatory disorders include obstructive lung diseases such as asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases such as a chronic bronchitis, emphysema, bronchiectasia or bronchi bronchiolitis obliterant and cystic fibrosis and the restrictive lung diseases that affected the parenchymal that's interstitial lung diseases, sarcoidosis, lung infections such as pneumonia or coronary vascular diseases associated with lung diseases or carcinoma of the bronchialveolar system and so on the reversibility of the obstructive lung diseases some obstructive lung diseases the obstruction is reversible some in other cases not A reversible chronic obstructive uh, lung diseases that's the bronchial asthma that the accumulation of the inflammatory cells the mucus and the exudates of the bronchi and the smooth muscle cells contraction in the peripheral and the central airways that causing relatively a dynamic hyperinfiltration during the exercise the irreversible form such as this chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases fibrosis and narrowing of the small airways loss of the elasticity glycoid due to the alveolar destruction and destruction of the alveolar support that maintain patency of the small airways bronchial asthma the asthma that causes recurrent episodes of wheezing breathlessness chest tightness and coughing particularly at the night or in the early morning in the following i'm going to show you an asthmatic attack <coughs> As you saw, the patient was coughing and wheezing, and that looks like a life-threatening situation. 
So the asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder. So the airways at chronically inflated airways are hyper responsive. They become obstructed and airflow is limited by the bronchoconstriction, a mucus plug and increased inflammation. The airways are exposed to various risk factors such as a host dust mites, animal with fur, pollens, respiratory viral infection, exercise, strong emotional ex uh, exertion, chemical irritant, drugs such as aspirin or beta blocker, and so on. The inflammatory mechanism of asthma has two parts. That's an early one and a late one. The early one is mediated by the Ig, IgE, and the late one usually, this is the unknown mechanism, but the eosinophil granulocytes taking place in it. The multiple cells, such as the macrophages, eosinophils, histiocytes, and T lymphocytes, the helper two cells, are many mediators released, cytokines, growth factor, enzymes, superoxides, are involved following the various airways challenges. Now, in this scheme, you can see that the first, when the allergen is stimulate the dendritic cells and including production of the P, uh, immune globulin E2 and activate the helper cells, the T helper 2 cells, and this T helper 2 cells is going to stimulate further IgE mediated cell production or immune globulin production and this IgE is attached to the mast cells and when the next trigger comes these mast cells is degranulated and activates further neutrophils and releasing some other substances proteases some cytokines and gathering more eosinophils and these long-standing inflammatory processes that usually destroying the epi epithelial shedding and activates, for example, the goblet cells and makes more mucus. And this kind of epithelial cells loss let, let's see, the allergen penetrates to the deeper area of the bronchite and making, let's see, the vessels leaking out. So the plasma leaching, edema is happening. And the cholinergic bronchial hyperactivity can be seen. So the patient has an advanced and ongoing inflammatory processes that finally completely restructuring the bronchial uh, freeze. Chronic obstructive lung disease is a progressive disease that gets worse over time and causes airflow limitation that is not fully reversible. The airflow limitation associated with an abnormal inflammatory response of the lung to noxious particles or gases. COPD can cause coughing that produce large amount of mucus, slimy substance, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and other symptoms. Importantly, cigarette smoking is the leading cause of COPD. Long-term exposure to other lung irritants such as an air pollution, a chemical fumes or dust also may contribute to the COPD. The pathophysiology of the COPD usually starts with the increased bronchial fluid. This is due to some irritant. This inflammation, thickening of the bronchial wall and causes hypertrophy of the smooth muscle cells. The thickening of the sign, discrepancy between the protease and antiprotease, uh, alveolar damage, narrowing the small airways, inflammation going on, fibrosis, the resistance airways is increases, and usually they do have a mixed form. As you do see the cigarette smoking that releasing the free radicals and that activates the macrophages or destroy the epithelial cells and activates the inflammatory processes causing the degranulation of the neutrophils, activate the monocyte macrophages and the fibroblast and the fibroblast activation causes a fibrosis of the small airways and the protease that usually causes the destruction of the alveolar wall or uh, mucus hypersecretion occurring. So this is the circus viciosus that happening if they continuously uh, loading the system with the free radicals. The type of the COPD has mostly that is associated with, for example, smoking and that the chronic bronchitis. The, the chronic bronchitis is a clinical diagnosis and 
the diagnosis is made on the course of the coughing and the type of the coughing. The, if the patient has a clinical cough associated with sputum production more than 90 days of a two successive years, now this is the diagnosis for clinical uh, or bronchi or chronic bronchitis. You have to rule out the tuberculosis, tumor, or congestive heart failure. Mostly the cause is due to the smoking or air pollution on occupational exposure and, and other irritant. The pathologic changes. First of all, we do have an increased mucus gland secretion, and that's mucus accumulates in the small airways and plugging the small airways makes difficult to exhale or inhale. And this recurrent inflammatory processes of infec infection subsequently causing the scarring and increases the terminal airway resistance. The compensation is a difficult one because the relative to the patient by uh, activating the respiratory muscle system, it cannot ventilate the pump function, cannot approve, let's see, the oxygenation. What will happen? The patient will have a hypoxia and the breathing center is going to be blunted and be less responsible to the hypoxia. So the patient lives together with hypoxia. If you look at the skin of the patient, that can be cyanotic. And what will happen due to hypoxia? The erythropoietic level increases and making more red blood cells. However, the red blood cell accumulation is going to increase the peripheral resistance and that can cause right heart failure. The acid-base parameter is changing and the chronic uh, hypercapnia it's leading to the compensation of the, the kidney and the, ster, uh, the and the base excess or a buffer base level at the standard bicarbonate level is going to increase. This type of compensation, this type of patient has it's called the blue bloater type, where they do have a big and edematosus and coughing uh, patient. Another type of the emphysemic patient. This patient is not obese, usually is a, a skinny one, and they are sitting and fold uh, in the front, and all the time is puffing. And if you look at the lips, this looks like the purse lip. Now what is the pattern mechanism of the emphysema? It's not only the mucus production, but the increased elastase activity that is going to decrease the elastic recoil and this makes that uh, usually destroys the wall of the alveoli or the terminal bronchioli. Mostly is associated with smoking again, or that's a hereditary alpha 1 and alpha 1 and tritrypsin deficiency. And what will happen? We do have a general overall hyperventilation of the alveoli. Now, what will happen? Because the elastic recoil decreases, this is why the alveolar pressure decreases, and the closing pressure, when the pleural pressure and the bronchial pressure is equal, is going to fall in an area of the terminal bronchioli that doesn't have any hard wall. So this way it is going to collapse. Now the patient can somehow uh, normalize the ventilation, and this is why it's going to have this uh, holding the breath back, so usually you exhale against a resistance. This is a purse lid, and this is why it's puffing all the time, so makes the airflow slower, and this way is going to shift, let's see, this equilibrium pressure point to the area when we do have a hard cover wall. Because the patient is ventilates a lot, this way they don't have hypoxemia. However, they are going to pump out more CO2, so usually the CO2 level is normal. And the patient is non-cyanotic, and, and there is no uh, polycythemia, and this is what is called the pink puffer, or usually it's a pink and it's puffing all the time. Now, when we want to compare the clinical symptoms or features of emphysema and chronic bronchitis, you can see that, for example, the dysmoe usually is very severe in emphysema, however, in mild in chronic bronchitis. The coughing, 
usually occurs in emphysema following the dyspnea, why in chronic bronchitis before the dyspnea. The sputum accumulation it's very much, for example, in chronic bronchitis, but a very small amount in emphysema. Infection is very rare with emphysema, however, is very frequent one in chronic bronchitis. The ventilation insufficiency usually occurs terminally in emphysema and in repeatedly chronic bronchitis, usually when we do have a bigger mucus accumulation or it's triggered by infection as well. The partial pressure of the carbon dioxide usually is low in emphysema because it's hyperventilated, Why in chronic bronchitis is elevated, so it's hypercaptic one. The oxygen tension in, uh, in emphysema relatively is not decreased too much, however, in chronic bronchitis, yes, it's decreased. Hematocrit value stays in the normal range in emphysema, however, in chronic bronchitis is higher one due to the erythropoietic level. The DLCO, the diffusion capability of the lung, so how the diffusion occurs across the alveolar membrane usually is decreased in emphysema very much because the area of the alveoli is decreases because these alveolar little bubbles are disrupted and is opening up with a very big uh, big ball and this is why the surface area be less why in chronic bronchitis doesn't decrease too much core pulmonale is a right heart fail failure it's rare is emphysema however it's common one in chronic bronchitis The bronchiolitis obliterant that's a rare and life-threatening forms of non irreversible or uh, obstructive lung diseases in which the bronchioles are compressed and narrowed by fibrosis or inflammation. The clinical feature mimics pneumonia without any kind of response to antibiotic. Bronchiolitis obliterans can be due to some toxic fume inhalation such as a sulfur dioxide or ammonium or nitric monoxide or phosgene or paraneoplastic pemphigus or lung transplantation, connective tissue disorders, some autoimmune disorders, or post-infections due to pneumo, uh, uh, mycoplasma pneumonia or viral infection. Bronchiectasia. This condition characterized by the chronic permanent dilation and destruction of the bronchi due to destructive changes in the elastic and muscular layers of bronchial walls may be diffused or localized, resulting in the impairment of the drainage of the bronchial secretion, secondary uh, disease. That's a secondary disease, usually. That's usually induced by inflammation. The pathogenic mechanism is the common thread in the pathogenesis of bronchiectasia consists of difficult cleaning secretions and recurrent infection with a uh, circus viciosis of infection and inflammatory resulting in airway injury and remodeling. Very commonly that cystic fibrosis can cause bronchiectasia in its early age. This is the scheme for the pathogen mechanism. So the infection, the microbiological nation and inflammatory processes, destruction of the muc uh, mucociliar clearance and again some uh, release of the inhibitors and proteases and everything that is going to lead to the uh, uh, lung uh, secretion, increased lung secretion, mucus secretion, and this mucus plug is plugging the airways and destruction of the uh, wall relatively causes the dilation of the walls. So this is how the circus physiosis is going to develop this bronchiectasia. The pathom, uh, cystic fibrosis. The cystic fibrosis is caused by the mutation of the gene, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, and the improper cellular retention of the sodium chloride, the lung and the pancreas, and this way the sodium chloride withdraws the water from the airways and resulting in a dry and very sticky mucus production. And this mucus production, very thicky mucus, doesn't lack the cilia to work to clean up the airways and airway obstruction occurs, resulting in a respiratory infection and tissue damage. It's estimated that about 
one out of ten injuries carry trait for the cystic fibrosis and if the patient is diagnosed with these diseases usually the age of six months and uh, this patient usually doesn't live longer than age of 29 or 30s let's look at the interstitial lung diseases interstitial lung disease is the name for those diseases that uh, the parenchyma of the, or the interstitium of the lung is affected. Usually the inflammation and scarring make it hard to get enough oxygen. The causes include some autoimmune diseases or occupational exposure to molds, gases or fumes. Some types of interstitial lung diseases have no known cause at all. The pattern mechanism. Usually the interstitium causes involved. The injury that occurs initially uh, stimulates the typhon alveolar epithelial cells or capillary of the endothelium and that causes edema and hemorrhage and fibrin deposited along the alveolar walls, highly membrane production, and now the inflammatory phase, the infiltration of neutrophils, macrophage and lymph lymphocytes that releasing cytokines and influence the subsequent intensity a duration of the disease process and fibrosis and the repair mechanism. The inflammatory process subsides proliferation of the type 2 alveolar cells and organization of the fibrinous exudate occurs, collagen deposited, destruction of the lung architecture, architecture and enlargement of the alveolar air space. The subsequent inflammatory process promotes the lung damage. How can we diagnose the respiratory failure? First of all, it's very important to take a history. The patient's symptoms, mentally, due to hypoxia mainly, when we do have headache, visual disturbance, confusion, hallucination, dyspnea, it can occur at rest or accessionally, cough, sputum production, check spade, and physical examination. The laboratory test includes the uh, pulse oximetry that's a very simple way to check the oxygen saturation this usually is abbreviated by the SPO2 uh, that's almost identical with the arterial oxygen saturation that's an error it's about three percent difference between these two uh, it's more precise on the arterial blood gas analysis <coughs> it relatively is provides an indication of duration and severity of respiratory failure and is going to give some information about the oxygen tension, the carbon dioxide tension and the pH. Another, the full pulmonary function test that you already studied in physiology and imaging techniques such as the chest X-ray, CT, CT angiography, ventilation, perfusion scan can be taken. Let's start with the spirometric evaluation. The spirometer and a pulmonary function test that measures the volume of the air an individual inhales or exhales as a function of time. Spirometry measures how, how much and how quick the air can expel following the deep breath flow or the rate of which volume is changing as a function of time can also be measured in spirometry. As you hear, see? the volume in time and they do have such values such as a peak expression in pressure or the forced vital capacity or the reserved volume and the TRC is the total line capacity that can occur. The measurements of the spirometry is depending on age, height, sex, and weight. At the age of up to 24, usually we do have more and more FVC. And after 35, that's on the plateau, and after 35, it's going to decline. All spirometric measurements increase by body weight. It is due to the increase in number and the size of the alveoli relative to airways. The large lungs are likely to take longer than the smaller one. Sex, the pulmonary function values are lower in female than in male. Weight, as spirometric results are positively correlated with the weight to the extent that increased weight means growth of muscles mass. In obesity, the spirometric value 
and the lag value, especially the ERV, decrease with a greater weight, mainly due to the diaphragm dysfunction. Let's look at the volume and time graph. And we do have the volume against the time. There are several parameters can be read on. For example, the force vital capacity, that's the amount of air that can be expired as quickly as possible after taking the deepest possible breath. Fev1, that's the volume of the air which can be forcibly exhaled from the lung in the first second of the forced expiratory maneuver. The ratio of the Fev1 over FVC, that's called the Tiffano Pinelli index, it indicates what percentage of the total FVC was expelled from the lung during the first second of forced exhalation. This value is critically important in the diagnosis of obstructive and restrictive diseases. The FEF25 percent, that's a forced expiratory flow at 25 percent of the FVC and FEF75 percent the forced expiratory flow at 25% of the FVC and the difference between the 25 and the 75 that's a forced wide expiratory flow rate. This is the graph how it looks like in different diseases such the normal situation that we do have about the FVC about 5 liters and at the first minute we always exhale the ore why in the restriction the form of the graph the same however the bottom is going to be up so meaning that we do have a residual volume similarly to the obstructive lung diseases however if you're looking at the fev1 over the fvc that's about the same in uh, restriction why in obstruction it's very slowly it decreases so the fev1 over the fvc it's very low the flow volume loop can be measured is simultaneously the inspiration and expiration and in different portion of the call can read out the different measurements such as the fev1 fvc or or uh, fif for example the inhalatory side as well Here you can see three different uh, flow volume loop. At the first one, this is a normal one, when we do have a normal flow loop, a rapid peak expiratory flow rate with a gradually decline line and flow back to the zero. During obstruction, the rapid expiratory flow peak and after rapidly descend and more quickly than the normal and takes on the concave shape. The restrictive one has very similarly to the normal one, but this little curve is smaller one. Here you can see the different curves and the contour of the loop assists the diagnosis and localization of airway obstruction as different lung disorder produce this string easily recognized pattern. The first one is a normal one, the next one is obstructive diseases, is emphysema. The following one that we do have, as you see here during the inspiration, we do have an extrathoracic obstruction, while we do have here the intrathoracic obstruction, and here we do have uh, the carcinoma obliterating the bronchial obstruction, and uh, the fixed uh, upper airways obstruction, that inhalation and exhalation as well, or the restrictive one, the same pattern, however, the smaller one, and the last one this is a neuromuscular weakness when we do have a very small run shape expiratory and inspiratory loop when you interpret the spirometry you have to look at first of all the uh, shape of the flow volume loop after look at the fab one value that should be over 80 percent next one the fvc value that's again should be over 80 percent and look at the ratio f1 over the fvc that should be greater than 70 percent and look up the main uh, expiratory flow that more than 60 percent 
Let's see the interpretation of the spirometric result. Normally, if every parameter is normal, that's the normal one. Early obstruction or small airway obstruction occurs when the FEV1 and the ratio of FEV1 over FVC are normal, but the, me, uh, the mid F, uh, aspiratory flow is less than 60%. Pure extraction occurs when the FEV1 value is less than 80% and the ratio is less than 70% and the FVC is normal. The mixed type, when we do have obstruction with restriction, the FEV1 is less than 80% and the ratio, the FEV1 over FVC, is less than 70%, while the uh, forced vital capacity is less than 80%. And in this case, we should perform the volume, the lung measurement of the lung volumes. Restrictive defect if the FEV1 value is less, FVC is less, however, the ratio of these two is normal. And okay, we have to measure the volume, the lung volume. The Bronho dilatory reversibility test is used to differentiate between asthma and chronic obstructive. Uh, pneumonia. Uh, the general uh, usually performed at the time when we make the diagnosis after it's not necessary. It's useful, as I said, between the asthma and the COPD. First we have to measure the FEV1 value and after using a Bronho dilator, salbutamol, we look at again the FEV1 value. If it's improved by 12% or a 200 ml, that's the diagnosis for asthma. If not, so is no improvement occurs, that's called the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the irreversible form. The next one be the lung volume measurement of the lung volume. The lung volume measurement usually is performed uh, when we do have a low FVC results. Let's get the restrictive or obstructive with hyperinfiltration or air trapping or mixed pattern for or equivocal spirometric findings. We cannot state what is the problem directly. What kind of method we are using? Uh, they used to use the gas dilution test, but today they are using the body platysmography, the body box. In the gas dilution test, what they use, the nitrogen or helium, and they measure the helium concentration, what was in the exhale, and they could measure how big volume was the gas is distributed. This is how they could measure, let's see, the lung volumes. Because the helium doesn't readily diffuse across the alveolar capillary membrane. The body platysmography this is the most used uh, method when the patient is sitting inside the fully enclosed rigid box and breathe through a mode piece connected to the shutter to the internal volume of the box. The subject makes respiratory effort against the closed shutter like venting, causing their chest volume to expand and decompressing the air in their lung by breathing in and out again into the mud piece. The volume of the gas within the thorax can be measured by changes in the pressure inside the box and allowing the termination of the lung volume as well. This is what you can see the pattern. We do have the tidal volume. We do have the maximal vital capacity, the TLC value. This is the residual inspiratory volume or the expiratory capacity. And we do have the functionally residual capacity. We do have residual volume. So this kind of um, parameters can be read out. Looking at the flow volume in the case of obstructive lung diseases, you can say that uh, due to the gas trapping, the functional reserve capacity is increased plus the hyperinfiltration as you do see that the total lung volume is increased plus we do see a reduced expiratory flow as well and the residual volume is increased in restrictive lung diseases there are two types when we do have an intrinsic and severe chest wall disruption when the total line capacity decreases, including the reserve volume as well. So the ratio can be normal. 
and the functional reserve capacity decreases and the tidal volume decreases as well. In extrinsic restrictive lung diseases, the total capacity decreases why the reserve capacity stays normal and the ratio it will increase. The functional reserve capacity decreases and the tidal volume is going to be less as well. This graph represents a pulmonary function test of a COPD patient. This includes the spirometry data, the lung volumes, the airway resistance and the diffusion capability by measure of the carbon dioxide diffusion. As you see here, we do have the percentage values compared to the normal values, the hardened percent. In this patient, we do have a decrease, about 50% of the normal uh, force vital capacity. The FEV1 value is only 25%. The mid-air flow is only 10%, while the peak uh, expiratory flow is only 33%. However, the total lung volume is increased to 162%, Why the residual volume is increased also, almost 3.5 times more than a normal should be, and uh, the uh, tidal volume is only 57%, and expiratory reserve capacity is only 19%. The airway resistance increased very much in this case. Why, if you look at the uh, diffusion constant of the carbon dioxide, it's almost in a normal range. Let's look at the gas transfer that usually is used to detect the diffusion capability of the alveoli. For measuring the gas transfer, they are using carbon monoxide. The value that had expressed as a DLC or TLCO. DSU and TSU represent the diffusion transfer capacity of the lungs for the carbon monoxide. The difference between DSU and TSC only hardly expressing. TSU express is an SI unit, the millimole per minute per pascal, while DSCO express the milliliter minute per millimercury. This is the diffusion lung capacity for the carbon monoxide, also known as a transfer factor of the lung for carbon monoxide. Sometimes they're expressing as a KLCO. The KLCO is uh, uh, usually that's a transfer coefficient that is not uh, including the area effect. So they are going to normalize by the alveoli uh, volume. Now, uh, the transfer capacity is going to depend on the area. If somebody is suffering, for example, lobectomy, they do have less area, so the DSC or TSC is decreasing. However, in a healthy area, the transfer is completely normal. So this is, if you want to measure directly the transfer capacity, what they do, they are normalizing with the alveoli volume. Now, the indication for the measurement of the DSCO that usually when we do have an abnormal spirometric data, for example, in asthma versus uh, COPD or restrictive diseases, interstitial, uh, interstitial or chest wall diseases, or when we do have a suspect for the pulmonary vascular diseases, such as a pulmonary hypertension, or uh, let's the severity of the DSCO data, the normal value is ranging from 80 to 140 percent, the mild uh, decrease is 60 to 80, moderate decrease 40 to 60, while the severe decrease is less than 40 percent. Now how do they perform, how do they perform this test? The patient inhale a small amount of carbon monoxide and withhold the breath for 10 seconds and then exhale. The carbon monoxide uh, has been chosen because it has similar physical uh, properties to oxygen, the solubility and the ability to diffuse across the membrane. However, carbon monoxide very strongly bound to hemoglobin so that all the carbon monoxide transfer across the alveolar wall is retained within the circulation and not exhaled. The test based on uh, comparing the amount of inhaled and exhaled carbon monoxide in the uh, air. The difference that you got, this is uh, proportional to the uh, transferred carbon monoxide or the diffusion capability of the lung into, uh, from the alveoli to the blood.
the interpretation of the DSEO. Uh, DSEO decreases in any diseases that allows blood to pass through poorly ventilated area. So when the ventilation and perfusion is less than 0.8, such happening in obstructive lung diseases, in emphysema, cystic fibrosis, or intrinsic interstitial, interstitial lung diseases, pulmonary fibrosis, ARDS, pneumonia, or cardiovascular diseases, such as pu uh, primary pulmonary hypertension, uh, pulmonary edema, pulmonary thromboembolism, or fat embolization, but anemia, smoking, pulmonary resection, or pregnancy also altering the DSEO value. Now, DSEO increases in any condition that leads to increase the capillary blood volume. So this way, this ventilation and perfusion ratio is bigger than one. That can happen in polycythemia, pulmonary hemorrhage, left to right, intracardial shunting mechanism, when the pulmonary blood flow increases. But mild congestive heart failure, asthma, or morbid uh, obesity and exercise also increases the DSEO value. Bronhier Challenge Test. Bronhier Challenge Test, it will help to diagnose asthma. The patient breathes in metacholine or histamine. Metacholine and histamine is going to cause bronchoconstriction. When they perform it, when the patient has typical symptoms of asthma, but physical exam and usual spirometry pre or post bronchodilators haven't confirmed the diagnosis, or in patient with non-specific symptoms, which could be uh, from asthma, e.g. chronic cough, chest, tightness, and sleep disturbance. The inhaled drug uh, stimulates the upper airway sufficiently to cause uh, violent coughing. The test is physically demanding. This test is contraindicated in patients with severe airway obstruction, include the uh, obvious worsening of the obstruction, and only perform in hospital condition. There are another test, this is called 6 minutes walk test. This is going to help to diagnose an interstitial lung diseases when the patient has a decreased uh, diffusion capability. As you see here, this chart is going to show you how the hemoglobin is saturated in, uh, and how much is the PO2 value in the oxygen saturation. Normally, when we do have enough time for the uh, diffusion of the oxygen to the capillaries and uh, oxygenize the hemoglobin, the patient has a completely 100% uh, PO2 value. However, when the diffusion, cap uh, diffusion capacity decreases, at rest we still have a normal oxygenation of the hemoglobin. However, by increasing the rate, increasing the cardiac output, the contact time will less and less. So this way, the time that passing through the alveoli, it won't be enough to pass the oxygen and uh, oxygenate the hemoglobin normally. So this patient usually is suffering of hypoxia by exercise. If you do have a completely abnormal uh, diffusion capability, at rest the oxygenation is inappropriate. How they perform? Basically, they measure the blood pressure, the pulse, and the oxygen saturation, ABG test. And after ask the patient to walk at any pace and any time stops is necessary. And after six minutes walk, they repeat again the ABG test and they're measuring the oxygen saturation or the uh, partial pressure oxygen and carbon dioxide and pH changes as well. And from this data, they can conclude that is any uh, discrepancy with the oxygen diffusion in the alveoli or not.